thank you for everyone who worked on this program tonight uh, at the Dallas Fed, and we appreciate all of you being here. How many of you are coming to the Fed for the first time? Okay, welcome. And the number of hands is getting lower and lower every time we do one of these things, and that's been our goal, is to try to open up the Fed to the community, bring in leaders like Larry Summers. And so we can't do what we do without your active participation and your leadership. This is how, it's really by talking with many of you here in this audience that we understand economic conditions, that we do our analysis, and that we present our views at the Federal Open Market Committee. So thank you for being here, and thank you, Larry Summers, for agreeing to do this. We really appreciate it. And I guess I'll start with, uh, and Mark alluded to this, both your parents were economists, uh, your uncle, is Paul Samuelson, was also a, a award-winning economist. Uh, was there ever any doubt that you were going to become an economist? <laughs> well, I have two brothers, and uh, they're not economists. And so my father used to joke, uh, given what they are, that it's worked out perfectly for he and my mother. Uh, a doctor, a lawyer, and someone who went into the family business. <laughs> And I'm the person who, uh, who went, into the, went into the family business. I originally thought, uh, Rob, that I was going to, I went to MIT, and I thought that perhaps I was going to be a mathematician or a physicist. And I saw what real mathematicians or physicists were like, and I decided I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and um, so I, be, I became an economist basically because I had two passions. Uh, thinking analytically and scientifically about things, and working on real problems that affected real people that had the prospect of making the world a better place. And I thought that a career in uh, economic research and economic policy would enable me to pursue both those passions. And I haven't looked back uh, with a moment of regret uh, since I made that uh, decision a little more than 40 years ago. Hmm. And you've obviously had illustrious careers in academia as well as in the government. What are the differences between being a leader in academia and working in the, uh, as a leader in the government? How's well, the transition as between a professor, each? as a professor or student for that matter at Harvard or any other University of Houston or any other uh, university, the single worst thing you can do is to sign your name to something you didn't write yourself. <laughs> On the other hand, <laughs> as a government official, <laughs> it's a mark of effectiveness <laughs> to do so as frequently as uh, possible. That's one difference. Hmm. Here's another difference. As a researcher, if a problem is really, really hard and there isn't an elegant solution to the problem, what you do is you change your research to a different problem. <laughs> In government, as President Obama is finding out with respect to Syria, you don't have that luxury. You have to deal with the problems that events uh, turn up. That's another difference. Another difference, which, uh, another thing that I thought was a difference, and then I learned that perhaps it wasn't so, was uh, when I was in Washington uh, working with President Clinton, I imagined that Washington was, and I was right, that Washington was really very political, that there were constant rivalries and struggles and people with a sense of prerogative. Uh, trying to do each other in. And I supposed when I went back to be the president of Harvard, that Harvard was going to be very different. Uh, <laughs> that there wasn't any politics uh, at uh, Harvard. That was not how it turned out to be, at least as uh, I experienced it. Uh, Henry Kissinger uh, once said of university life, the fights are so vicious because the stakes are so small. <laughs> and you know, when you, when you see grown women and men going to war over uh, 
the details of freshman language requirements, hmm. um, you can relate <laughs> to that sentiment. On the other hand, I think a lot of what have, takes place in universities, uh, what kinds of speech are we going to permit and what kinds of speech are we not going to permit, what kinds of values are we going to transmit, a lot of what gets determined is actually very fundamental for uh, the structure of our society. I've always had an approach, and maybe this is the last contrast I'll draw up, I've always had an approach um, to thinking about what to do when I'm in the university and what to do when I'm in government. When I'm in government, I think my job is to figure out things where we know the answer and to try to get it done. We sort of know what the right tax reform is. We sort of know some things about raising capital levels to make the financial system more healthy. We know some things about how to respond to recessions and downturns. And basically the job is to take what we know and figure out in this enormously complex system with many different, comp many different factions how to get it done. When I'm in the university, my view is that if you're not there, it's very hard to know all the challenges and issues that decision makers are facing. And so what you really need to do is think about the problems where we don't know the answer. What we can do about middle class incomes that haven't grown as rapidly as we would have liked. How we can get the unprecedentedly high level of international cooperation that's necessary to address climate change what we do about the challenge of social inclusion uh, suggested by the fact that today one in seven men between the ages of 25 and 54 isn't working and if current trends continue at mid-century it might be one in three men between the ages of 25 and 54 who aren't working. So my approach when I'm in the university is not to peer in the window of the uh, people who hold the jobs that I once held and try to tell them to do differently, what to do differently. Rather, it's to try to build intellectual capital and broad understandings that, uh, can, that will contribute over time to our finding uh, better solutions uh, to major national and global issues. So you, in your answer, you touched on this issue. You've talked a lot about prime-aged uh, men, prime age males, who are employed at a historically low rate right now in our economy. What, what, what's going on there? Why, why do you believe that is happening in the United States? So first the facts, and that I'm pretty confident about, and then the causes, and there I'm less uh, confident. Uh, in 1965, one in 20 men between the age of 25 and 54 was not working. Today it's about one in seven men, and the trend has been pretty smooth. Democratic presidents, Republican presidents, recessions, booms. It's been a pretty smooth upwards, uh, upwards uh, trend. And I take that group because it's the group where there's the strongest social expectation that kind of everybody should be working. People who are younger might be in school, people who are older might be retired. Situation of women is uh, in, most parts, in most parts of the country, in most families, more ambiguous because they may be home uh, raising, uh, uh, raising children. And so this is something that's been going on for a long time. And it's being driven by some combination of factors on the demand side and factors on the supply side. Um, basically, if you uh, work with your mind, if you work with your hands and you do something routine, technology is increasingly replacing what you do. And that's making it harder to find a job. And if you have a job, that's making the wage that you get for doing the job lower. And we think of that as some futurology thing that's going to happen when they're driverless cars. But the truth is, it's been happening. Just look at the fact that we've got a tenth as many coal miners as we did 40 years ago. 
we've got a third as many steel workers. And the examples go on. So the set of things on the demand side. And then there are a set of things on the supply side. Uh, people who are out of work for a long time tend to like to stay out of work. People, we have done more, and it's been well-intentioned, and I think it's mostly been right, to provide social protection for people who aren't earning incomes. But that social protection can be an incentive not to go back uh, to uh, work, and that's gotten more generous uh, over, uh, over time. It's more fun to watch television when there are a thousand channels and when there's video games you can use on the screen than it was when there were only three channels and all they had during the day was soap operas. And there's some evidence that that's a portion of uh, what's going on uh, as well. But uh, how we're going to address this as a society is, I think, a very important question. All right, so we'll, we'll come back and talk about that a little bit. That's, this is all a, that's a part of a broader term that you've used frequently called secular stagnation. You might explain to the group what's secular stagnation um, and, and what are the implications of it? So start with this, Rob. Um, we had a stock market crash in 1929, and then the economy was awful basically, until the Second World War, called it the Great Depression. So GDP grew a certain amount uh, between 1929 and 1940. We had a financial crisis that began in 2007. We don't quite know yet what will have happened over 11 years, but we've seen the first nine. So we can do the same thing. We can project out for the next two. And the answer is that it'll be just about the same. That the economy went down much further during the Great Depression. But if you look over 11 years, it's no better. And it's no better whether you just look at the GDP or whether you look at the GDP divided by the total number of adults or whatever other measure you're going to have. So we've had a very disappointing recovery. We thought at the beginning that this was all the breakdown of the financial system caused by deregulation and over leveraging and all that kind of stuff. But by 2011, that stuff had mostly been repaired. The banks had paid back all their TARP money. The interest rate spreads had gone back to being uh, narrow. There was a sense of financial normalization. But the economy didn't accelerate. And that's what led me and others to think we had to have some theory of very slow growth that wasn't just a theory of the financial crisis. And so I have been involved for some years now in resurrecting a set of ideas that were discussed in the 1930s that with World War II and the post-war boom sort of lost their relevance, but maybe coming back to relevance. Um, that go under this phrase, secular stagnation, which means stagnation that's going to last a long time. And the essential idea is that for a whole set of reasons, many, many people want to save more than they did before, to pay down debt because they're going to live longer, because there's more uncertainty, because more of the money is going to rich people who have a higher propensity to save relative to poor people who spend uh, more. So you've got a big increase in the propensity to spend, to save, and at the same time, you've got a big reduction in the propensity to invest. Some of it, as you've emphasized, Rob, is because of demographics. We don't have a growing labor force at, at the pace uh, that we once did. Much of it is uh, technological. Who's going to build hotels in the era of Airbnb? Who's going to build shopping malls in the era of e-commerce? Who's going to spend vastly on information technology when my cell phone has more computing power by a factor of 100 than the whole of the Apollo project uh, did? And so a reduced propensity to invest, 
a higher propensity to save, something's got to give, and that's the reason why interest rates are as low as uh, they have been, because they can't really balance that supply and demand for capital. And in fact, in order to really balance the supply and demand for capital in a way that pushed the economy forward, interest rates might even have to be below zero. But they can't really get very far below zero because if they did, we would all just hold cash rather than hold uh, bonds that had a negative rate. And so that's been the major policy uh, challenge, I believe, uh, for the last number of years. And I think it helps to explain why um, nowhere in the industrial world is inflation expected to get to 2%, even looking over the next 10 years. Why, if you look at so-called real interest rates, interest rates that are adjusted for inflation, they are uh, negative in most of the industrialized world and uh, zero uh, in the United States. And they're the reason why um, our growth has been so sluggish and disappointing. And with sluggish and disappointing growth, we experience um, low inflation. And of course, that relatively weak level of demand contributes to the problem that we talked about a moment ago, having to do with uh, more and more men who are looking for work. It contributes to middle class incomes not rising as fast as people hoped they will and as fast as they once uh, did. And it contributes to the great frustration that seems to be an underlying feature of politics uh, in this country um, and, uh, and in others. And so I think it's a uh, very large challenge for us. So you think this phenomenon may be part of why we have such political polarization, the, the underlying uh, impacts I think it's part of, of the reason we have such anger and disappointment. I think when people are feeling good and when all the surprises are pleasant, they're much more easy to get along with hmm. than when uh -huh. uh, the surprises are mostly, dis when the surprises are, uh, are mostly disappointments. Uh, I don't think that people, frankly, who are turning to uh, candidate Trump uh, would be doing so in as large numbers if they had the feeling that the economy was providing steadily improving opportunity for them and that it was going to provide their kids with better opportunities uh, than uh, they had had. So let me uh, turn to what can be done about this and we'll We'll do, uh, we'll do fiscal policy and other governmental actions second. Let's start with the Fed, close to home, and you and I have talked a lot about this. What should the Fed be doing? Rob, I'm disappointed uh, in uh, the Fed. I think the Fed has, I think the Fed made a mistake last December when it raised rates, and there were several hundred thousand more people who were out of work than there would be if rates had uh, not been raised. And they were enlisted in a war against inflation, those unemployed people. But the market is telling you that if you look at the 10-year bond and the 10-year indexed bond, it's telling you that, the, that we are only expecting 1.5% or less than that uh, inflation even though the Fed has a target of 2% uh, inflation. Uh, so I think it was a mistake to raise rates in December. I think it would have been a terrible mistake to raise rates uh, in uh, September. And I'm glad that the Fed decided not to do that, though I'm disappointed that there were three voting members of the Federal Open Market Committee who dissented from that judgment. And I'm worried by the Fed's signal that it intends to quite likely raise rates in December. I'm a bit relieved that the market doesn't believe the Fed 
and that the market thinks that there's a less than 50% chance that rates will be raised in uh, December. But the first rule of holes is when you're in one, stop digging. And we've got inflation that's below target, and we've got growth that's inadequate. And so what the impulse could be that would lead to um, hitting the brakes is not something uh, that I'm able to under, uh, that I am uh, able to understand uh, easily. I think I'll say just say one more thing. I think what needs to be appreciated is that because of all those factors that I described a moment ago, having to do with higher savings and having to do with reduced investment, what constitutes a normal interest rate has changed very profoundly and has come down. And that means that an interest rate that would have been wildly expansionary 10 years ago or 20 years ago is today an interest rate that's necessary to prevent an economy that's grown at well under 1.5% for the last nine months, an economy where the level of total hours of work has not increased at all over the last six months. That's an economy where the danger is stalling out. And that's not an economy where I think you want to be uh, thinking about uh, raising, uh, raising rates. I think it is, uh, I think uh, to raise uh, rates in the near future uh, would be an unforced error. And, you know, it, it could change. I mean, the data could change. Inflation expectations could start to accelerate. The economy could, uh, could start to overheat. And one certainly needs to be vigilant. And there's no reason to make the mistakes of the 1970s. Uh, and it's really essential uh, not to do that. But I think to use old concepts of normal when the world has profoundly changed is the pattern of most of history's great mistakes, whether it's in economics or in diplomacy um, or, uh, in, uh, any other, or in any other sphere. So I think the Fed needs to just let this economy expand to the extent it can and at the same time, it needs to recognize that, to use a very old phrase, you can't push on a string. And there are limits to how much expansion the Fed can generate. So I'm not saying that the Fed should be doing some wild new quantitative easing program. I think there are a lot of reasons why that's quite problematic. But there's no reason to be hitting, there's no reason uh, to be hitting the brakes. What I think the Fed can support and encourage, and I think this is where you we're going to take us, is uh, towards uh, fiscal policy. Look, uh, just because Donald Trump says something doesn't make it wrong. And, um, <laughs> and he was absolutely right when he said in the debate last night something that I've been saying for a couple of years. Uh, LaGuardia Airport's a disgrace. <laughs> it is a disgrace. Now, I ask you, if a moment when materials prices are really low, a moment when we can borrow money for 30 years at 2% in a currency we print ourselves, and a moment when we have this huge problem with the non-employment of strong men, if this is not the moment to fix LaGuardia Airport, when will that moment ever be? <laughs> and I'll tell you another thing. We've got an air traffic control system in the United States. Let me give you three initials that play no role in the air traffic control system of the United States of America. GPS. Vacuum tubes, yes. GPS, no. That is not as it should be. I visited a school years ago when I was Treasury Secretary. 
And I went to a high school economics class. And they had an assembly, because I was the Treasury Secretary, and I gave what was hopefully a pretty good speech about uh, the importance of education and said the kinds of things you'd expect somebody to say about the importance of education. And I'll never forget it. Young teacher, probably been teaching four or five years in her high 20s, came up to me and said, uh, Secretary Summers, that was a wonderful speech. Just one thing. You said that education was the most important thing for the future of our country. Why should the kids believe that when the paint is chipping off the wall of, the, of their classroom? It's not chipping off the wall at McDonald's. It's not chipping off the wall at the movie theater. It's not chipping off the wall at Walmart. Why should they believe that education is really the most important thing to this society? I have no answer. And there are tens of thousands of schools where paint is chipping off uh, the walls uh, in our country. So people say we can't afford it. There's the old cliche, well, we probably can't afford not to do it. But there's a different point as well, which is it's much cheaper to do it. It's not like we're never going to repair LaGuardia Airport. It's not like the potholes in the roads are never going to get fixed. And I ask you, does the cost of repair go up faster or slower than the 2% interest rate? I think it goes up a lot faster than the 2% interest rate. And so even if the only thing you cared about was the long-term health of the government's finance, you'd be investing much more heavily in infrastructure. And that's not even thinking about the fact that it puts people back to work. That's not even thinking about the fact that it gives our economy more capacity. And that more capacity isn't just some abstraction that is good for some businesses that are going to use that. It's good for all of us. It's probably, it's probably more true in the north where there's snow than it is down here. But the American Society for Civil Engineers estimates that we are each paying the equivalent of a 70 cent a gallon gasoline tax because of the extra repairs to our cars that are made necessary by the extra potholes in our roads because we don't maintain our infrastructure. And so I think a very important piece of this is what we do on the investment side as well. Let me ask you about a couple other, uh, uh, a couple other topics related to this. Uh, and some of the thing, other things that have been mentioned. You mentioned infrastructure, a couple others. Uh, uh, we've talked about dramatic increase in vocational training as well as you know, regular school training, uh, regulatory review at the federal, state, and local level, which is a touchy, obviously sensitive subject, and depending on which corner you talk about, what are your views on those other steps? And then I'm going to get to trade after you've hit on those. Look, I think, it, I think one of the things we don't quite say enough in our country is... Um, Roughly 60% of our young people start college. Roughly 30% of our young people finish college. And roughly 40% of our young people don't get to go to college. And the 40% of our young people who don't go to college tend to come from poorer families by a substantial amount. And they tend to be poorer through their lives. And so whenever, anybody, whenever I hear anybody talk about how important it is to give debt relief for college students, and it is important to give debt relief for college students, I think to myself, what about the other 40% who weren't lucky enough for some reason to be college students? Maybe they weren't lucky enough because their family couldn't afford it. Maybe, they're, maybe they weren't lucky enough because that just wasn't what, they're, uh, what they were cut out uh, to do. But we need to be spending more on the people who need more help. And that's why I completely agree with you on uh, the importance of uh, a whole set of issues having to do with uh, vocation, uh, having, having to do with vocational 
uh, education. Look, I, I think that I think these regulatory reform issues are uh, are very are very difficult. Look, uh, to take something that goes to what you all do at the Fed, I, I had two experiences in the last week, and they both feel valid to me, and I don't quite know how to kind of reconcile them. I look at what happened at Wells Fargo. It is like unbelievable. I mean, thousands of people were involved in creating millions of accounts that people were charged for every month that they didn't even know had been created. And the person who did that retired, feted and celebrated as an exemplar of the, of the wonderful culture of Wells Fargo and paid tens of millions of dollars. Now, it's just hard to hear a story like that and then go, what we really need to do is get the government out of the business of banking <laughs> so that bankers can run it with their principles. It really is hard to believe that. And this was not like some institution that was seen as a fly-by-night institution. This was seen as the respected face of quality banking. And you know, this is not an isolated story. I mean, you know, the, the base interest rate, the so-called LIBOR interest rate, which is the basis of your mortgage, it's the basis of the prime rate, it's the basis of a hundred other things. You know, they sat around and they manipulated the number. I mean, there's like, Zillions of emails implicating every major financial institution in the world in the setting of that rate. It's just hard to see things like that and not think that we need to regulate more. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, talk to somebody who uh, works in a bank and it is process 101. And yeah. after process 101, it is process uh, one, it is process 102. I mean, I have had the experience of uh, refinancing a mortgage, and it was unbelievable. I mean, you know, uh, um, let me see, sir. Uh, this mortgage is joint with your wife, um, Lisa New. Is that correct? Yes. Are you married? <laughs> And it went on like that for it went on like that for half an hour. I mean, it was not so lucky for the people who did this to me because um, it really wasn't so lucky for them because I lost my temper after 15 minutes and said, "Why do I have to do this?" It doesn't and sound like you. Why can't we write? Why can't? Well, you, uh, I, I, also, I said, "Why can't we? Why can't we just? Why do I have to do this? Why can't we just fill out the form? Why do you have to be reading me all this stuff?" And they said, "It's required by Dodd Frank." And I said, well, bad luck for you. I helped to write Dodd Frank. I'm going to hang up the phone. And you have your general counsel call me. Oh, brother. And you have your general counsel or somebody in your lawyer's office show me the part of Dodd Frank that says that I had to do this. Or you have someone very senior in your organization call and apologize to me. It's your choice. So, uh, and I got my apology. Um, <laughs> But the point is that I was right. I was right. It wasn't literally required by Dodd-Frank. But in a deeper sense, I was wrong because we had created an environment where they were petrified that if you didn't read your Miranda warnings to somebody every time they went to an ATM, you were going to get sued for hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I think the challenge for you, Rob, the challenge for the Federal Reserve, the challenge for everyone who cares about this is to find ways of balancing these two things. I think a really important principle is more individual accountability. And so I'll make one comment that I'm going to ask you about trade. One of the things we've been advocating here uh, is t uh, so-called tailoring. It's one thing for a big systemically uh, important institution to have very tough regulation. We've been advocating that small and mid-sized banks should probably have more tailored rules they don't present a systemic risk. And I'll just say that because we have some of our important relationships in the audience. We'd like to see that happen. But there'll be more time. We'll talk about that maybe at dinner tonight. Let me ask you, trade, as we've all noticed, has been a very popular topic uh, in this country on both sides. You and I have talked before and previously about NAFTA. Let's start there. 
What's your assessment? Was NAFTA good or bad for the United States? It was good. Nobody believes it, but it was good. Here's the truth. Um, you have to separate the issue of trade from the issue of trade agreements. We do trade with Mexico. We share a 2,000 mile border with Mexico. Mexico has done a set of things to develop its economy. It's a good thing for us that they have done those things to develop their economy because if they hadn't developed their economy, we would have 15 million more Mexicans fighting their way across the border with all kinds of complexities for the United States. Now here is the truth about what the world was like before NAFTA. We, for reasons that you can argue whether they're right or whether they're wrong, but it was the way it was, we didn't have any major tariffs on goods from Mexico. We didn't have any major quotas on goods from Mexico. Before there was NAFTA, if you lived in Mexico, you could produce a product and you could sell it here. On the other hand, Mexico had huge tariffs on American companies and huge tariffs on American exporters to Mexico and huge barriers that meant that in Japan, they partnered with Taiwan, they partnered with the Philippines to produce effectively and to sell. In Germany, they, they partnered with uh, Poland, they partnered with Yugoslavia to produce efficiently and sell. High wage and low wage labor together. If we couldn't partner, America was going to be at a huge competitive disadvantage. And so the question isn't, what about if we had no trade with Mexico? That was not our choice. The choice was, were we going to negotiate an agreement that was going to change American trade rules a little bit because they were already free, and Mexican trade rules an enormous amount and open up the Mexican market. And that was the judgment that two presidents, one Republican, one Democrat, George, George Bush and Bill Clinton, made. And I think it was the right judgment. And we are seeing right now what would have happened if that judgment had not been made. If you watch the markets, every day that Donald Trump goes up in the polls, the Mexican peso goes down. And every day that he goes down in the polls, the Mexican peso goes up. And right now, because of the things he has said and done, the Mexican peso is roughly 10 to 12% weaker than it would otherwise be. What does that mean? That means that every product produced in Mexico is 10% cheaper when it's sold in the United States in dollars. And it means that every product that's produced in the United States is 10% more expensive when it's sold in pesos. So if you ask, what is the strategy for causing more businesses to locate in Mexico, causing more Americans to face brutal competition from lower wage Mexican uh, labor, the strategy would be to do more of what's being advocated that has driven the value of the peso uh, down and has driven Mexico into uh, exporting more. Look, we have actually achieved, I mean, you would not know it listening to any of our political debate, but we've achieved a kind of remarkable thing in this country, which is if you look at the net flow of migrants now, it is roughly zero. There are months half years, when more people move from the United States to Mexico than move from Mexico to the United States. If you wanted to invent a strategy for maximizing illegal immigration into the United States, it would be to try, as the United States, to isolate and screw up the Mexican economy. And that's what repeal of NAFTA at this late date would be, because if we repealed NAFTA, we still would have an open market. Uh, with respect uh, to uh, 
Mexico. So I understand why people are frustrated, um, but I think it's the, it's the task of leadership to try to think hard about what the real consequences of the actions that you take are. And um, if we had not uh, passed uh, NAFTA, we would have a whole set of problems that we do not now uh, envision. Every time you hear about a trade agreement, don't ask yourself whether you're worried about the country in question. Ask yourself how much their market is opening up and how much our market is changing. And I think you'll find that in many of the cases, their markets are opening up a lot and our market already was open. Let's take questions from the audience. Please just uh, go up to the mic and don't be bashful. Hi, uh, Dr. Summers. Yes. My name's Joseph Callier. Your last comment about real consequences of decisions made, I want to know about the impact of Richard Nixon. What would America be like if he had not passed that EPA and we, he had not signed that legislation dealing with baseline budgeting? Didn't expect that question, did you? <laughs> <laughs> we said we'd surprise you. <laughs> it's not often that I'm at a loss for words. <laughs> uh, look, I think the EPA was a historic uh, achievement. Has everything, have I agreed with every single thing the EPA has done? No. Um, I just read a story in uh, today's Financial Times about a New World Health Organization report that says three million extra people die a year because of air pollution. Hmm. Almost none of them are in the United States. That's because we got on this problem quicker because we took the lead out of the gasoline before, which was reducing kids' IQs before other countries did. It's because we developed an environmental uh, consciousness. Does the EPA do things to excess sometimes? Absolutely it does. But am I glad to be in a country that has strong environmental regulation? Yeah, I, yeah, I am uh, glad to be in such a country. You know, I don't know what exactly the alternative to uh, uh, so-called baseline uh, budgets would be, but I'll, I'll tell you this, uh, we got a lot that you can complain about in our budgetary situation, and if you ask, is our budget as sustainable as I'd like it to be? No, it's not. But one thing that's kind of special about the United States is every six months, we all look at, from the President and from the Congress, a 10-year forecast of where revenues are going, where expenditures are going, where deficit's going, where debt's going. That doesn't happen in most other countries. And we don't make perfect policies even with it, but we make better policies than we would without that. Well, the, I look, wonder, can I give somebody else, let me give somebody else a chance just to get in some more questions here. Hi, this is Masaki Yoshimori. Uh, I'm Japanese. Uh, so it's, uh, my question is, uh, what do you think about to, uh, BOJ uh, negative interest rate? Uh, so it's, uh, in the future, it's, uh, will the Fed to adapt to a uh, uh, possible uh, negative interest rate? Second question is, uh, this one is uh, connecting... Let's, let's just stick with, let's stick with one. Let's, uh, let's see if we can tackle. That's a big one right there. Um, look, uh, negative interest rates are like certain medicines. There's certain medicines that are really very unpleasant in their effects and have really quite terrible side effects. On the other hand, and when you take them, you really don't tend to be very happy. On the other hand, you really sort of have to ask yourself, why are you taking those medicines? And you're taking those medicines because you have a pretty serious problem. And why are, why are interest rates negative in Japan? Um, they're negative in Japan basically because this secular stagnation problem that I described earlier, uh, high savings, low investment, 
is more virulent in Japan. And I think the instinct to reduce interest rates as much as possible uh, in Japan and to try to create uh, an inflationary psychology has been a broadly correct one. Um, I, I think there are limits to what the effects will be. And I think the kind of comments I made about fiscal policy um, and other comments I could have made about spurring private investment, um, I think have substantial applicability in thinking about Japan. Yes, please. Dr. Summers, I would like to ask a question. Why do you think there is such an unwillingness, political unwillingness, to uh, deal with TTIP? We have just killed it since trade is obviously good for a country with an, a stagnant economy with falling demographics. Why is it that we can not get something like the TTIP over the goal line? Well, I mean, a lot of the problem, with the, I mean, it's not, it's, that's not America's fault. I mean, I mean, America's got some problems with respect to the TTIP, but there's been a lot of problems uh, in both Germany and France uh, with respect to support for the TTIP. Look, I think the problem is that the way in which we have managed these trade agreements has given people the feeling that there's nothing in it for them. Look, I, I, I saw it when I was at the Treasury. You know, what was the, we would, be, we would negotiate a trade agreement in financial services. And what was it about? You know, could insurance company X sell insurance in Malaysia? Could, pardon me, Rob, Goldman Sachs do underwritings in countries such and such? Could how many ATMs could Bank X open in country Y? And so I think people like saw this and they thought to themselves like, who cares? Why is this a major thing that the United States is negotiating over? And why doesn't it negotiate over some things that I care about, like other people not subsidizing their products and taking my job away? And other people not having no minimum wage, so there's enormous pressure for us to have no minimum wage. And other people setting up their tax systems as big tax havens so that people move all their profits out and companies pay much less taxes so that working people have to pay much more taxes. And so I think the problem is that the trade agendas have come to seem like something that's about elite preoccupation rather than middle class concern, and the middle class has gotten mad. And that's the broad political problem uh, uh, that trade is running into in most of the, industri most of the industrial world. Makes sense. Yes, sir. Um, there's been a lot of political rhetoric about raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Can you talk about what that might do in regards to inflation and the economy in general? if that were to happen? I think the, I don't think the issues involved in inflation and the minimum wage are very, high, are very large. If you just look at what the increase in the wage bill would be and you take it as a share of the, and you take it as a share of the economy, you're not looking, you're not looking at something that's going to have a very significant uh, inflationary impact. I think the question of pricing certain workers out of the market and creating unemployment is a much more serious one. And I think you have to find a balance. And I don't actually think the right balance is the same everywhere in the country. In some parts of the, in some parts of the country, um, I think a $15 minimum wage will help people help establish a principle that I think is actually a pretty important principle, that people who work full time uh, should be able to um, live above the poverty line and support a small family above the poverty line. I think that's a pretty important principle. I think there are other parts of the country where a $15 minimum wage has to be thought of as an aspiration and something that you're gonna transition to uh, over time rather than something uh, that you're going to get to immediately. 
You say that because of the challenging economic circumstances in those places? Because I think the overall price, le overall price levels are lower. The overall productivity of businesses uh, is, uh, is, uh, is lower. You know, if you think about what um, a, uh, what is the kind of natural wage for uh, somebody performing custodial services um, in Manhattan and in rural Mississippi. Those are very different, and so I think a $15 minimum wage is going to be a much bigger problem in rural Mississippi. Makes sense. Please. You mentioned our uh, net in migration is essentially zero. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, our birth rate in America is below two. Uh, we have an immigration policy that uh, we allow people to come over and get educated, then we send them back. Can you talk about just our kind of a stagnant population growth, how it is impacting our economy and our immigration policy. Uh, if you were to try to change it, would you change it, and, and would that have an impact? I, I, I think um, I, I think there are two parts of what we need to do there. Um, I think we need more pro-family policies. Um, we are terrible by global standards on what help we give parents um, of newborn children, mothers or fathers, in terms of leave, in terms of paid leave, in terms of job security when they return. Every other major country is much more generous than, that, than we are, much more generous than uh, we are with respect to taking care of an aging uh, parent. Much more generous than we are in terms of uh, the ability to take two hours off to take a child to a doctor's appointment or see a child in a, uh, in a school play. And we just need to adjust as a country. And I think that's going to take some government action, because here's the problem. I think all employers can afford to do some of this if their competitors are doing it as well. But if you leave it to the miracles of the market, suppose that all the employers in an industry now don't have any parental leave policy, and I decide I'm going to be the one employer who has parental leave policy. Well, one, I'm going to bear some cost that's going to make it hard for me to compete. And two, I'm going to attract all the people who are expecting to become parents, and that's going to make it very expensive. So I think we need public policies that are more pro-family than the ones we have now. I also think we need more generous, uh, more open uh, immigration. Um, I, my view on this is that we need immigration with strong expectation of assimilation. Expected to, your kids are expected to learn English. They're expected to be in school, being taught in English as soon as they've gone through a uh, transition uh, period. You have to be coming here to work, not to benefit from our social, uh, from our social safety net, and we certainly need to do much more to hold on to some of the most talented people who now come to our great universities and who we actually encourage to go home and be part of businesses that are competing very vigorously with the United States. So yeah, I would be for more open but more oriented to assimilation uh, immigration policies and to more family leave. And I think if we did that, we could have a labor force that was growing at one to one and a half percent a year over the next generation, rather than half a percent a year over the next generation. And by the way, just for folks, that would translate into what in terms of GDP? What impact would that have? About an extra, that would translate into about an extra one percent a year uh, in, uh, in, G, in GDP, which is about $160 billion a year. 
at current magnitude. Let's try to squeeze in one or two more questions, then we're going to wind up. Please, Why sir. don't we take, why don't, why don't you, if I could suggest, why don't we take like two or three, and then I'll answer them all as a Done. Group. Let's do it. Uh, Dr. Summers, um, having grown up in Texas, it's important to me for more local representation rather than national or even federal um, beyond the global perspectives that we have. It's fascinating me for years that our government uh, has an FC PA requirement, but yet we spend billions of dollars supporting other governments where we could spend that money in the fourth ward or we could spend it in Philadelphia and, and enhance that education that you talked about. Okay. Let's get your question. Hi, I'm Mohammed from the University of St. Thomas. I want to ask you, do you think uh, it would be effective to re-implement the Glass-Steagall Act? Thank you. Sir. Hi, I'm wondering if you have any finance-related book recommendations? And then let's get, let's get the last one right here. Thank you. If you, sir, if you could design a tax code from scratch, what would it look like? Okay, perfect. All right. <laughs> Taxes, um, broader base, fewer deductions and exemptions, and lower rates would be the basic principles of the tax code uh, that I would uh, uh, describe. Books. Books on, uh, books on finance, um, uh, old classic, Charlie Kindleberger, Mania's Panics and uh, Crashes, and recent uh, book by William Getzman, his title I don't remember, but it's a history of finance over 6,000 years, making the point that finance isn't just a bunch of people trying to speculate around and gain an edge, but is actually a very fundamental thing in a society, which is connecting those who want to defer their consumption to the future with those who have the opportunity to productively invest. And the ability to do that well is central to having a, uh, uh, central, central to having a uh, well-functioning um, economy. Um, with respect to... Uh, foreign assistance versus spending money at home. Um, I guess I invite you to consider that I think a lot of what we do in foreign assistance and diplomacy is best thought of as forward defense of our security interests. And that when we don't do that, we end up paying much larger costs uh, at a later point. If we had done something like the Marshall Plan after World War I, we might not have had to fight World War II. If we had provided the right kind of support to the Kerensky government in Russia, um, we might have avoided 70 years of, co of uh, communism uh, with uh, Lenin. It is much cheaper to make subsistence in a reasonable way possible in the Middle East and the Sahel than it is to deal with what the consequences of millions of refugees are going to be uh, for Europe. Anytime somebody tells you that we've got too much, mar too much foreign aid and too much mushy-gushy diplomacy stuff, uh, just think about this. Um, the United States right now has 10% more people who are members of military bands playing a musical instrument than it does diplomats and foreign aid workers. Hmm. That does not suggest to me that we've got a big excess in the other area. Maybe we, maybe we got too much military music, but um, it, does, it is worth keeping in mind uh, when, you, when you think about uh, our priorities. And I missed one question. What was the one in the middle about? Glass-Steagall. Oh, Glass-Steagall. Um, uh, look, I, I was, so just truth in advertising, fair warning. Um, I was Treasury Secretary when Glass-Steagall was, was uh, repealed. So you might decide that I wasn't entirely objective on, uh, on the question. But no, I don't think it was a mistake. Uh, I think it was the right thing to have done, actually. And I guess I would make these points. Um, first, um, whatever it was you didn't like had already happened before we repealed Glass-Steagall. 
JP Morgan was engaged in commercial banking and it was engaged in investment banking. So it had already happened to a substantial extent. Second, none of the trend, there was no transaction that took place between the repeal of Glass-Steagall and the financial crisis that wouldn't have been possible without the repeal of Glass-Steagall. Third, if you think about the institutions that were caught up in the crisis, none of them, almost none of them, were really implicated by Glass-Steagall. Bear Stearns, pure investment bank, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Lehman Brothers, pure investment bank, not touched by Glass-Steagall. AIG, insurance company, not touched by uh, Glass-Steagall. Washington, Washington Mutual, Wachovia, banks that failed, not touched by Glass-Steagall. Citigroup was touched by Glass-Steagall, but the activities that got them in trouble were not activities that uh, would have, were activities that would have been legal for the previous uh, 30 uh, years. So it's hard to draw any link from Glass-Steagall to the crisis. What about the solution? The government would have had to spend billions of dollars more if J.P. Morgan had not taken over Bear Stearns. And that was made possible by uh, Gla that was made possible by the repeal of Glass-Steagall. If Bank of America had not been able to take over Merrill Lynch, that period would have played out in a much more catastrophic uh, fashion. As Rob well knows, if it had not been possible to open the discount window to um, Goldman Sachs and to Morgan Stanley the situation would have been a much, much more difficult situation uh, to have, uh, to have uh, dealt with. Here's the thing. We want our institutions to be stable. In order for them to be stable, there's a big advantage in their being diversified. If you don't let them do anything except make standard commercial bank loans to commercial real estate, then you're making them enormously vulnerable when bad times come. If you permit them to be engaged in a variety of different business activities, they've got much more diversification and capacity to respond. I'll give you an example. S suppose J.P. Morgan had been broken up into seven pieces. One of them would have been the London Whale. And when the London Whale happened, there would have been systemic risk and bailouts and panics and all of that, rather than just a big hit for J.P. Morgan's uh, shareholders. That's an example of the success of diversification. This isn't just theory. If you look at who came, who came through the financial crisis very well, not Europe, not us, not Japan. Canada came through very well. Australia came through very well. And they've got so-called universal banks that actually are able to do an even wider set of things than we're permitted to do. So I'm for much stricter financial regulation in a whole set of areas, principally which greater levels of capital liquidity are probably most uh, important. But I at least can't see the case that I think Glass-Steagall wouldn't, Glass, if Glass-Steagall were still there, there's no chance that it, would have, that it would have prevented the crisis. If it had still been there, it would have substantially complicated the response to uh, the crisis. And I think financial authorities should sleep better at night knowing that inst large institutions are more diversified, which Glass-Steagall makes possible. Larry, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for your insight, your leadership. And, uh, Every time I talk to you, I always learn something new. I think it's extremely valuable. It's my own view to the country, to the world, that you're out there, you're doing this work, you're speaking your mind, you're prodding us, uh, you're, uh, you're pushing us to, uh, as to how we think about things. And so I really appreciate your thoughts. I appreciate you being here in Houston. And I want to thank everyone 
here for being here tonight and uh, for a great evening. But thank you again. Uh, we thank appreciate you. it.